Thank you so much for checking out Crossroads' YouTube page. Uh, if you enjoy what you hear today, please hit the subscribe button right below here. Hope you enjoy the message. God bless you. And God is good this morning. Amen. Are you excited to be here this morning? Give God a hand this morning. So I got up really early, and I was going over my message again, and I, I, was, I was in the house. Um, and you know how you can get in the house, you get really excited, and I was like, Anybody watching me? Because I just looked like a complete fool up in the house. Because I was getting all excited, jumping up and down, talking about this message. I am so excited about this message today. Um, if I had to title this message, the message would be titled, Thankful. Because the battle is not yours. And that's the truth. The battle is not ours. A lot of times we want to take up the battle, but we, it's not ours. It's already won. You know, if you look at, um, this thing is giving me all kind of trouble here on the side of my head. My ear must be deformed. I know it. So there we go. So then, if we look at the nation of Israel, it is one of those oddities. There's no way to explain how the nation of Israel has lasted as long as it has outside the divine revelation and the divine hand of God being on it there's no way the nation of Israel could have survived for 3,000 years there has been a nation that we've thought about and we have called Israel and sometimes they were great sometimes they were a mighty force and sometimes it looked as if the nation of Israel was going to completely be gone we've had some terrible times in history that, you, that we thought the nation of Israel and th you, they're going to be destroyed but Jesus said this Jesus said as long as there is a sun and moon as long as the sun appears in the morning and the moon appears at night, there's going to be a nation of Israel. And as, and as long as you get up in the morning and you see the sun rise, you can count on Israel being there. Because God's hand's upon it. You don't have to worry about it. Now, you get up in the morning and the sun ain't there, you better be worried. And it, it's really funny you know, throughout history, different nations have thought they have destroyed Israel. They thought that this is it, that they're ended. That, but you can't outdo God's will. You cannot do that. One of the, the earliest non-biblical references that we've ever seen that, that has to do with Israel, there's a monument in Egypt that's in a museum. That, that The Egyptians, they go and they look at it today. And it's this monument it's the earliest recollection uh, outside the Bible that you can find that there's something written about Israel. And on this monument, there was a Pharaoh in Egypt, he, and, and what had happened was he had went into Syria, and he had went into the Palestine region, and he had just completely, what he thought devastated that region. And he came back and he made this monument, and on it, he wrote, among other things about Israel, that Israel is desolate. He said, there's no seed left in her. And as all, we all know, that's false. Because no man's hand can destroy Israel because God's hand's upon it. It makes you think about, you ever heard of Mark Twain? Mark Twain's famous quote says, reports of my death have been highly exaggerated. And so were the reports that Israel was going to be destroyed not going to happen God has guaranteed their continuance you can explain Israel's survivor only by the hand of God there's no other nation that is ever where you see people that have been scattered over the earth that can come back together and form a nation again that has never been destroyed all the other nations across the world they come and they go but Israel remains constant It's funny that today we're going to be in one passage of Scripture. I'm not going to be jumping around a whole lot. We're going to be in one book. 
And some people say, praise God. If you got your phones or you got your Bible here, we're going to be in 2 Chronicles 20. Uh, if you go to the Bible app, you can see in a, one of the events that it's all listed out for you there. If you find Crossroads Church, there we are. All the, you can go back and check it out, read this passage of Scripture, and do. Whenever you hear anybody preach on Scripture, you go and read that for yourself. You don't take anybody's word for it. I may be telling you wrong. I'm not. But this passage of Scripture in Chronicles 20 is an illustration of a battle which Israel was victorious. And I'm going to tell you, I think this is the greatest battle that Israel ever fought. This is greater than their conquest of the Palestinian land. This is greater than the battle of Jericho, in my estimation. And it's used. It's it's, this battle is used in the final books as a precursor to what Armageddon is going to happen. This battle is fantastic. It occurred during the reign of this, of this king of Israel named Jehoshaphat. And he was king of Judea, the southern kingdom. He said, y'all, come on, that's funny now. Lord, have mercy. But in this chapter, we find a recorded day in the life of Jehoshaphat. And if we start in verse 1, it says, After the armies of the Moabites, the Ammonites, and some of the Menunites declared war on Jehoshaphat, messengers came and told Jehoshaphat, A vast army from Edom is marching against you from beyond the Dead Sea. They've already at Hazaran Tamarai, however you say that. Now, the three nations that are mentioned here are ancient enemies of Israel. And they lived, if you look at Israel, you can see the Jordan, Red, Jordan River, and they lived just on the other side of the Jordan River from where Israel was at. And these three, country, these three nations, not only are they enemies, but they're also related to Israel. If you go back and you look at the Bible and you look at all the names you ever see in the Bible in the very beginning where this person begat that person and begat that person and we normally skip over that, there's a reason why they, that's in there. It gives you the history and how all of these regions and people are connected. Now these three kingdoms here that are coming against Israel not only are enemies of them, but they're also related to them. The Ammonites. And the Moabites were descendants of Lot. That's Abraham's cousin. That's where these nations were formed at. And the Edomites were des descendants of Esau, Jacob's brother. And they were relatives of Israel. They had, already, they had always been hostile. Man, when you get into a family fight, you can have a fight, right? And that's what was happening here. You got all the kin folks, and they're mad at each other, and they're coming against Israel because what had happened is, is in their minds they knew that Israel was God's chosen. And they were upset about that. It was very significant of when this battle took place. If you look at the timing of when it's, this happened, this, was, this, was a, this is a symbolism of a spiritual battle that happens. Because if you go back into chapter 19, Jehoshaphat had just had a major breakthrough in the, in the, in the kingdom of Israel. Well, he had had this great revival that had happened and things should have been great. Jehoshaphat had great reform happening in Israel. It says that Jehoshaphat lived in Jerusalem, went out again amongst the people of Beersheba of the hill country in Ephraim, and brought, back, brought them back to the Lord, the God their fathers. Jehoshaphat had this great revival going on. They were enjoying fruits of this revival. And they were at this period of rest 
you know, they had brought the people back to the Lord. They should have been at this time of rest. They should have been this great things happening. You know, when you think about revival, you think about all this stuff that had happened that should be great. And it should be a time that you're rejoicing and that you're victorious and you, and you kick back a little bit and you're, you're, you're drawing into what God had done. And that's where the, the children of Israel were at. They were expecting God's blessings to be poured upon them because this great revival had happened to the land. They had turned from their wicked ways and they thought, man, this is going to be great. And at that moment, these messengers come to the king and said, hey, about 15 miles from here, these, these armies are going to, they're ready to attack you. And this assault, it's a symbolic of the attacks that we walk through in our life. It's not just a battle that happened. It's very symbolic of what we go through. Think about this. Tragic circumstances that strike us like a death of a friend, a loved one. or Perhaps if you're a parent and you get a, you get a message that maybe you're your, your, your son or daughter has walked away from the Lord. Those are tragic times. Tragic times. If you're a young, if you're a young person, maybe it's the, you, you, you heard that your parents are separating. Or maybe those assaults happen during times that we all get tempted to go back to sinful life that maybe we walked away from. Maybe sin comes into our life and we thought that had been eradicated from our lifestyle, that we would never be tempted with that again. But you have this assault that happens. This battle of things coming against you. Or maybe, I don't know about you guys, have you ever felt like you experienced a dry time in your life? that you feel God's not listening to you, that you can pray out, you can cry out to God, but everything that you do, it feels like it's just bouncing off heaven, that God's not hearing you. Those are attacks. And frequently those come after a time of great revival or a great awakening or a great dedication like you come in and you like God I take it all I'm ready to give my life Lord I'm ready to get this straight Lord I'm ready to to come back to a relationship Lord I'm ready to go do this thing that you've called me to do God I'm ready to to move forward in a bigger way often those times right after that are the times that those attacks will happen in your life you're expecting, because I've dedicated my life, Lord, I've, 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 I'm, I'm saying, God, I'm all in. I'll do whatever you ask me to do. You expect those to be great times, but often those are the times that the enemy will try to attack you. That's what happened to Jehoshaphat. Right at the time that he was expecting things to go well, everything became to fly apart for him. The messengers appeared in his household and told him that the army is evading just a day away. Fifteen miles. This place was 15 miles from Jerusalem. If we look in verse 3, this is Jehoshaphat's reaction. He said, Jehoshaphat was terrified by the news and begged the Lord for guidance. He also ordered everyone in Judea to begin fasting. So the people from all the towns of Judea, Judea came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. Now Jehoshaphat's initial reaction was to be afraid. And that initial reaction is not wrong. Like we hear the verses of, you know, don't fear or, or those things. That, and, and God has given us, there's 365 times in the Bible where it says don't fear. But that's not talking about the initial fear. That's talking about what do you do with the fear once it comes to you. It's not the initial fear that's wrong. It's how you walk through the next step. He was frightened. He did not, he did not have the resources 
to meet this attack. Sensible for Jehoshaphat. Man, when the messengers came to him, they were like, you wouldn't believe it, this army. There are three nations that are coming against us. It's okay to feel fear when those kind of attacks come upon your life. When you don't know what to do next, it's okay to feel fear at first. The question is, is what does fear do to you afterwards? Does it drive you to be irritable? Or resentful to God? Does it cause you to go into a rage and maybe strike out to people around you? What does fear do to you? What does it make you do? Does it make you retreat? Does it make you walk away? And man, people can get fearful about a whole bunch of things. Opportunities that maybe God has laid out for you. God, I don't know how to do that. It's okay. It's all right to be fearful, but walk through it. What does it do? do you, you're not supposed to retreat. We're not accountable for our immediate reaction when assaults come on our life. We're accountable for what we do next. Jehoshaphat set his face to seek the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast in Israel. Now, a fast involves denying yourself food for a period of time. Now, when people tell me I need to fast and pray, I'm like, you better be sure you know what you're talking to. I like food. You can see that. But fasting has always been something that God's people have done. From time to time, it's necessary requirements to give that up and here's the reason why because sometimes we can get so caught up in the natural resources that we forget who is the author and the director of all those things and where our source comes from See, for a period of time he was calling the nation of Israel to set aside their thoughts their minds and their their physical needs and put their focus completely on God. See, denying yourself of food by fasting goes much deeper than just denying yourself and going hungry. Like, you've got to be willing to look outside of your physical need and start looking for a deeper and for where your source is from. The idea of fasting, it means deny yourself any resource resource other than God himself. Because our tendency in the times of stress is to start casting out for what's tangible. See, we want to start looking for what our visible resources are. We want to start looking at where we put our hope. In the times of stress, people start checking their bank account. What's my physical resources here? He said, Jehoshaphat, he he could have called all the army together and said, let me see what we got. Let Let me get the rest of, let's get the women and children here. Let's get them all lined up. Do we have enough physical resources? But no, he said, this battle is going to be won spiritually. And he took his eyes off the physical resources and called a fast and said, let's put our, our, our eyes on spiritual resources. And that's what fasting does for you Jehoshaphat declared a fast because he wasn't going to depend on any natural resource for this battle but he would set his face to seek the Lord and in times of stress and times of When things feel like they're coming apart, you got to set your face to the Lord. You got to put your eyes on Jesus. Got to do that. So, the first thing to do when you're afraid, deny your your tendencies to go back to the things that you've always counted upon. Remind yourself that He and He alone is the source of all your help. It's the same thing Paul talks about in Ephesians 6 when he says, gird the loins with truth. 
It's pulling your thoughts together, reminding yourself that there's only one place, ultimately, where our help comes from. Jehoshaphat stood before the community of Judea and Jerusalem in front of the new courtyard at the temple of the Lord. He prayed, O oh Lord, God of our ancestors, you alone are the God who is in heaven. You are the ruler of all the kings of earth, and you are powerful and mighty. No one can stand against you, O oh our God. Did you not drive out those who lived in this land when your people of Israel arrived? And did you not give this land forever to the descendants of Abraham? This attack is representative of what happens in our life. The assaults that come against us. In this next passage of verse, if you look at this, famine. Judgment happens when a sense of guilt and condemnation assaults us. Famine is those dry spells that we all experience from time to time. And 8 through 12 here, it says, Your people settled here and built this temple to honor your name. They said, Wherever we are faced with any calamities such as war, plagues, or famine, we will come to stand in your presence before this temple where your name is honored. We can only cry out, when we cry out, you to save us, you will hear us and rescue us. And now, see what the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir are doing. You would not let our ancestors invade those nations when Israel left Egypt. So they went around them and did not destroy them. Now see how they reward us. For they have come to throw us out of your land, which you gave us as an inheritance. Oh God, won't you stop them? We are powerless against this mighty army that is about to attack us. We do not know what to do, but we are looking for your help. The first thing that Jehoshaphat did when he was plagued with his trouble was he reminded himself of where his source was coming from. And that's what you have to do when an attacks come in your life. You've got to remember where your source is. The very first thing you do, where is my source? My source is not from my job. My source is not from my family. My source is not from anything other than God Almighty. And a lot of times we get, we get that all messed up. We start thinking, man, if I don't have this or that, my source is gone. That's not true. My source comes from God. The second thing that he began to do He began to remind himself of who God really is and what God had already done. You know why it's important that when God does victories in your life that you start writing those things down? Because you will forget them in times of trouble. But if you'll write those things down when God does victories in your life, if you'll make a note of it, if you'll write them on, the, on your heart, that when trouble and trials start coming up, you can pull that out and say, look what God's already done. I know what he's going to do now. And that's what Jehoshaphat, he started saying, God, are you not the same God that did this? God, are you not the God in heavens? Are you not the ruler over all the kingdoms of the nation? He begins by calling his mind to who the Lord really is. Aren't you the God of heavens? Don't you reign in the realm of spiritual realities? Aren't you sovereign? Think about this. When things and troubles come against your life, do you think God's up there pacing the floor going, Oh my gosh, well, that's bad. Mm, that's bad. Oh Lord. I don't know what we're going to do. You think God's up there biting his nails? You think when Jehoshaphat had these enemies down there that he started biting his nails? Oh, I don't know if he's going to be able to get out of that one. No. He's up there going, I've got this. I'm the God of peace. He's not up there anguish. He's not pulling his hair out thinking, what are we going to do now? He's not shaking. He's absolutely tranquil. He's not troubled in the one least bit. He is at peace. He's not anxious. He's not out of control. 
He is the control. He's not only in control of heavens, he also rules over all the nations. All the nations. This means he rules over the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Edomites. And he rules over the same people in the Middle East today. If you don't believe it, he, I'm going to tell you right now, he rules over our president, over the cabinet, over the senate. He rules over your household. He rules over my household. He rules over this church. And anytime we get that out of order and we think that we're in charge or somebody else is, you're wrong. Whatever the situation is, God is in control. He is sovereign. He's not under attack. He is not threatened. He is at peace. He is quiet. He is restful. And Jehoshaphat starts reminding himself of that. He's saying, though everything is chaotic going around him, that kingdom is, seems to be tottering on, the, on, the, on destruction. Starts reminding himself of who God really is. Then Jehoshaphat not only reminds himself of who God is, but what God can do. If you look back in, in, in six and, six and eight, 7 and 8 of verse 20, he says, Oh God, did you not drive out those who lived in this land when your people arrived in Israel? And did you not give this land over for the to the descendants of your friend Abraham, your people settled here and built this temple to honor your name. It calls his mind to the deliverance of Israel and the promise that God had already given him. And no matter who tried to force them out, God had already won those battles. This land belonged to them. It was given to them by God. It was guaranteed their place. And God had shown them time and time again that he was in control and what he could do. And Jehoshaphat was standing on those principles. He's looking at him and he's like, I'm powerless in my own right. We don't know what to do, but we're going to cast our eyes on the Lord. Not only Jehoshaphat, but all the people stood there. I can imagine that he's like, I don't know why this happened. God, why are you letting this happen? This should have been a time of great revival. What are you doing, God? I don't see a way out. I don't know what to do. I don't have the resources. But I'm going to put my eyes upon you. We know we're powerless. Any of you ever felt like you're powerless? I've got no way out other than me. It's all right. Y'all can, you can interact. Feel like you're powerless? You are. God's completely in control. But whenever we take that position that we are powerless and we put our, our eyes on God, God has all the power. C.S. Lewis says it like this. He said, if, if men needed wisdom throughout the ages, they might cry out, William Shakespeare, help me. And nothing happened. Or they might need courage and they cry out, Billy Bud, help me. And nothing happened. But C.S. Lewis said, for 1,900 years, whenever a man cried out, Lord, Jesus, help me, something happens. This was true in the life of Israel, and it'll be true in your life. Whenever you cry out to the Lord, God, help me, something happens. Jehoshaphat cried out to the Lord, I don't know what you're going to do. But you know my distress, you hear my prayer, and you're going to do something. We move down to 13 through 15. This is, as all the men of Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, wives, and children, the Spirit of the Lord came upon one of the men standing there. Let me tell you, there's power when we stand together. There's power when we come together in unity. There's power that is unstoppable. His name was Jahaz Jah Jahazazel, son of Zechariah, son of Benaiah, son, son of Jael, and Mahat Mataniah. I know I messed all those up. 
If you got questions about that, send your email to jake at crossroadsantioch.org. A Levite who was descendant of Asaphah, I don't know how to say that. He said, this is what the Lord says, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged by this mighty army for the battle is not yours but God's. See, the demand doesn't rest upon you or I. It rests upon the Lord. It is His battle. But too often we get into this big panic about what we're going to do. It's not our battle. The battle's not yours. The battle's God's. And he goes on to say, he, li- he said, listen, all you people of Judea and Jerusalem, listen, King Jehoshaphat, this is what the Lord says, do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by the mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march out against them. You will find them coming up through the, the yeah, ascent of Ziz at the end of the valley that opens into the wilderness of Jeril. But you will not even need to fight. Take your positions, then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. He is with you. O people of Judea and Jerusalem, do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them tomorrow, for the Lord is with you. King Jehoshaphat bowed low with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judea and Jerusalem did the same, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites and the clans of Kohath and Korai stood to the praise of the Lord, the God of Israel with a very loud shout. They stood there and they knew that the battle wasn't theirs. They stood there worshiping God. They don't need to fight. They only need to stand still and watch the battle be taken care of. But the thing is, this is not just a physical stand. They had to go out and face their enemy. They had to take this mental posture, a position that the the understanding of what God would do. They had to go face their enemy. They had to stand fast in their mind. And that's a lot harder than the physical battle, is stand in your mind. They still got to go face the opposition. It's never God's will when we come up against a hard circumstance that we turn and run. It's it's God's will that we put our eyes on Jesus and say, Lord, do this battle. I can tell you, any time that I've run from my position or run from a battle that God puts before me that God wants to teach me something or grow my faith, if I don't stand and face that battle, God will bring me back to have that same battle again. He'll take me around that mountain one more time. Because he wants to teach you how to grow your faith. He wants to teach you how to grow spiritually. He wants to teach you that he is God Almighty. You've got to know who God is. You've got to know what God does. You've got to stand on His promises. And that's what will enable you to face the problems instead of withdrawing or retreating or giving away to fear. I'm going to tell you, that, that, that's not something that just happens one time. That's something that has to be renewed time and time again. Like that happens all of the time. It's not like you flip a switch going, whoo, man, I got my faith up today. I'm good from now on. I'm never going to fear again. Because it normally happens like this to me. Like I go to bed at night, I'm going, whoo, man, I made it through the day. It's all good. I'm going to sleep good tonight. Man, God is in control. Then you wake up in the morning, and I'm good for about three minutes, and then I'm thinking, oh, my Lord, I got to do this, this, and this. How am I going to walk this out? God, I don't have the resources to do that. I don't know how to do that. I don't, I'm not smart enough to do that. And I've got to start flipping that switch again going, I, but I know, God, that you do have the resources. You do have the wisdom. You do have the power to overcome that. And that has to happen time and time again. 
Anxiety is not something that just goes away because you think it's going to happen. You've got to stand on the word of the truth. And you've got to keep doing it time and time again. But you do have to go out and face your enemies. Verse 20, it says, Early the next morning, the army of Judea went out into the wilderness to Koa. And on the way, Jehoshaphat stopped and said, Listen to me, all of you people of Judea and Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in the prophets, and you will be able to succeed. See, he's equating the words of the prophet to the words of God. And Jehoshaphat had to stop them that morning because they had this great... Thing that happened the day before but he wanted to make sure that they were still standing fast that day they had to be reminded that God is still the God today and that's what you have to do you've got to get up every morning and remind yourself of who God is fears and problems they're going to come back time and time again but you got to get your eyes off yourself and get your eyes on the Lord you got to get your eyes off the circumstances. you got to quit worrying about what your resources are. you gotta, you got to stop drawing from your own strength. you got to start drawing on the strength that God has got. you got to remind yourself that He can or you can't. And you may have to do this many, many times a day. But every time you overcome that victory, your faith will be strengthened a little bit more. In 21, it says, after consulting the people, the king appointed singers, whoo, thank God, to walk ahead of the army, sending to the Lord, singing to the Lord and praising him for his holy splendor. This is the, what they sang, give thanks to the Lord, his faithful love endures forever. Had they won the battle yet? They were on their way to the battle, and that's what you do. You put your musicians and your singers out front. You start praising and worshiping before the battle ever takes place. You're praising God for the battle that's already been won. you got to praise God for what he's already done. When you get up and anxiety starts happening, you need to start singing praises for what God has already won in your life. Because he has won the battle. Woo. He began singing. That action grew their faith before they'd ever even seen their victory. Philippians 4, Paul says, Have no anxiety for anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Get up and say, Lord, I need courage for tomorrow. I need courage for the circumstances. And then start singing praises. Thank you, God, for what you've already done. Thank you for the, for the money that you've already brought in. Thank you, God, for the victory that you've already overcome. You've got to walk in the expectation that God is already in control because he is. You've got to walk in that expectation that he's going to take care of your battles before you ever get there. And in verses 22 and 23, he says, at, listen to this, at that very moment, they began to sing and give praises. The Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting among themselves. The armies of Moab, Ammon, turned against their allies from Mount Seir, and they killed every one of them. And after they had destroyed the army of Seir, they began attacking each other. They turned on another. Let me tell you what happens. When the devil tries to get in your life and you start singing praises, he can't stand it. Your, your battles are won by the praise and, and worship that you do with God. He can't stand it. When you start quoting scripture, you start praising God for what he's done, your battles will be victorious. So they were going out to this battle. And they've got to go there, and you, you can just picture it here. Like they go up one hill, and they see the army out there. They go down into the valley. They don't see them, but they come back up. The army's still there. They start singing, Woo, Lord, thank you, Jesus. They go up the next hill. The army is still there. They go down the next valley. They come back up. 
The army is still there. They start singing louder. Can you imagine? They start giving praise and glory. They go down the next valley. They come up and then they come back up and they see everybody's dead. What happened? And it says, so when the army of Judah arrived at the lookout point in the wilderness, they all saw all they saw were dead bodies laying on the ground as far as they could see. Not a single one of the enemy had escaped. Have you ever thought about, man, something fear is happening in your life and you're overcome by it and you're like, I don't know how I'm going to face this situation and you walk into that and then when you get there, it's nothing, it's already dead? That's the way most battles happen. Like, the battle of fear in your mind is much, much worse than the battle usually ever is. Like we make up all these things in our mind like we get so excited about, you know, man, this is going to happen. I know this is going to happen. I know it. And you know what? If we just take our eyes off our situation and put our eyes on the Lord, God's already got that. Walk into the battle. I'm going to tell you the other night, Matthew and Terry did this concert. And they got to play with this really great player, like this world-famous player. They came home and told me, you know, before they did it, they said, Terry looks at her paper, and she said, yeah, we're doing this concert with somebody. I said, well, who are you playing with? And she says, Robin Ford. And I said, wait a minute, like the Robin Ford? It's like this dude's like on the top 100 of guitar players in the world, and they didn't even know they should be nervous. <laughs> I was like, are you kidding me? Y'all are getting to play with Robin? I got to come. I got I to go see this. This is crazy. I, I was like, Terry, are you sure? Like, Robin, Ford, did they misspell his name? I mean, you sure it's not Rufus Ford? Like his, his long lost brother that can't play? But no, I mean, but do you know they were people that didn't show up that had practiced because they got scared? They missed an opportunity that God had put out before them that maybe they could do these great things. But let me tell you, that's what happens. The, the enemy wants to deter you from, the, from what God wants to do in your life, from the blessing that God wants you to walk in. The enemy wants to stop you. Don't let him win that battle in your mind because I'm telling you, the battles are never as bad as we make them out to be. This adversity that appeared to be so tragic and it was going to be overwhelming never happened because God had already won it. But here's that. You think that's good enough for God? No, that's not good enough for God. Like, see, he defeated this enemy. Because you know Satan had done put it in their mind that they were going to destroy Israel. They were going to take all that Israel had. But let me tell you what God did. That was not good enough just to defeat them. It says they went out, King Jehoshaphat and his men went out to gather the plunder. They found vast amounts of equipment, clothing, and other valuables, more than they could carry. There was so much plunder that it took them three days to collect it all. The adversity that appeared so bad turned out to be this major blessing for God's people. I'm going to tell you what. That's what will happen in your life when you face the battles that God has called you to be in. That he, he'll take these times of troubles that the enemy wants to cause for evil and he's going to turn them into good. I promise you, the plunder will be so great that you ain't going to be able to collect it all. It took them three days. They came back with more than they left with. And worship team, if y'all want to come back, this is what Paul means when he says that there are more than conquerors through him who loves us. God takes the most traumatic, tragic circumstances of our lives and he turns them into triumph if we'll let him. And it says here on Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 20, 26 through 30, it says on the fourth day, they'd been gathering plunder for three days. It says on the fourth day, they gathered in the valley of blessings. They didn't change the name of the place of where they were fighting that battle. So they were going out to this place that was supposed to be so tragic. They were going to be overwhelmed, and they were going to fight this battle. But now they changed the name of it. They changed it to the name, the Valley of the Blessings, which got the name that day because the people praised and thanked God there. It is still called the Valley of Blessings today. Then all the men returned to Jerusalem, and Jehoshaphat leading them, overjoyed that the Lord had given them victory over their enemies. They marched into Jerusalem to the music of the harps, lyres, and the trumpets. 
They proceeded to the temple of the Lord when all the surrounding kingdoms heard the Lord himself had fought the enemies of Israel. The fear of God came over them, and Jehoshaphat's kingdom was at peace. For his God had given him rest on every side. And I promise you that will be your experience and my experience when we walk in what God wants us to do. God has blessings that he wants to over, overflow in your life if you will walk in the, in the battles that he's called you to and you'll not try to win them yourself if you'll put your eyes upon the Lord. If you'll stop when things happen in your life and you'll say, you know what, my God is this God. This is who God is, and this is what he has done in my life, and I'm going to give the battle to, over to him. The power is taken away from the enemy. The thing that caused so much stress and sorrow became the source of great blessings. It, it, it became encouragement. It became a result of peace. And it brought them peace from every side. Because, see, the battle wasn't theirs. The battle was the Lord's. Later on in Scripture, Joel is prophesying again of the coming of the Lord and the great victory he works on Jerusalem's behalf. He calls this place where that victory occurs, the Valley of Jehoshaphat, in memory of this victory that God had worked out on behalf of the king. Second Chronicles 20 is really an illustration of the victory that God wants to produce in mine and your life. See, life is a, it's a series of mountaintop and valley experiences. There are mountaintop times, man, when you're on top of the mountain that you're thinking, whew, this is fantastic. And then there's valley experiences you're thinking, man, Lord, why did you let me go through this? times when you're on the mountain you're thinking boy this is good there's times in the valleys it seems like everything's coming apart but I can tell you if you'll put your eyes upon the Lord those valley experience will, will turn into the valley of blessings if you'll just trust in God because God will provide for all your needs our responsibility is to stand to trust him and wait on God because it's his victory to work out amen now, I want to end this a little bit different today. I want us to all stand, and I want to do a worship song because I believe when we go walk out this door, we're already walking out victorious for what God is already wanting to do, for, for victories that God has already called us to win, for us to walk out and be victorious, for us to walk out and just be ready to shout about who Jesus Christ is. Amen? Amen. Let's get up and let's sing here. Hey, thank you so much for taking the time to check out Crossroads' YouTube page. We just feel so honored that you would take your time to see what we're about. Also, if you like what you see here today, check out our website at crossroadsantioch.org. You can enjoy us every week with our online sermons and even be a part of our digital small groups. We would love to have you part of our fellowship. And thank you. And don't forget, if you like what you see, to hit the subscribe button right below.